very much. Uh, you're very welcome to Benburn Prairie this afternoon. It's great to see so many faces sure, from all over, from taking in the tickets and everything else. And uh, it's great to welcome Paul all the way from the States and Paul Kingsworth back, of course. And I appreciate you all making the journey. So um, I just want to do a brief introduction. I'm Marcus, or Mark, whichever you prefer. And I want to say a few things about the, the thinking I had behind organizing this conference. So actually, I'll do a bit of housekeeping first. First of all, I apologize. We got a last minute uh, cancellation from Calvin Robinson, unfortunately. Most unfortunate, but I think on the providential side, as Paul said, we might be able to delve into some more deep, I would say deeper issues, and I hope that will bear some fruits of its own. So who am I really targeting with the conference? Just for starters, so I want um, this to be a symbiotic relationship between the panel here and the audience with a lot of Q&A. We hope then ultimately that the crowd here will go out renewed, transformed by the renewal of their minds, as I say. And uh, what we're doing here is ultimately really wrestling with some of the big questions that I think both Paul van der Klee and Paul Kingsworth have been delving into and the communities that they're starting to build around them have started to open up for people, going beyond the kind of simplistic sloganeering that we're bombarded with constantly, the propaganda and obsession with kind of worldly power. And uh, just why Benbar Prairie? So Benbar Prairie has a rich heritage of reaching out to the community, organizing cultural events. We had this new shop open, Creative Commotion, which is itself named for a journal that one of the priors had uh, introduced back in the 70s. They brought figures like Seamus Heaney, John Hume, went on to win Nobel laureates, or Nobel Prizes. And we want to build upon that tradition by bringing some big names here to help benefit the community. And um, why now, I suppose? So after COVID, it's, it's great to be back in person, to have these conversations that can't be replicated online. So I hope that it reveals itself today, basically. And um, meeting in person, I hope that we can make real friends, form real lasting uh, communities being transformed by the event, as I say. So um, with that, just a, we're going to structure it into a number of sessions. So we'll have breaks, uh, different intervals. We'll have lunch, dinner over here. And after the event, there'll be the opportunity for you to socialize. Uh, there'll be a bit of music. I've brought in some traditional musicians. There'll be drinks available in the cafe and that too. So we'll have five sessions. I'll start off myself and Paul, then myself and Paul Case North, and we'll, we'll bring the panel together later. So um, with all that said, I would ask Paul just if we, if you could say a prayer that we will be getting on the truth of this conference and that it bears rich fruit. Sure, sure. Let's pray. Lord, you are a good and great God, and you don't treat us as our sins deserve. And you have gathered us here this afternoon from many different places, from many different walks of life, probably with many different opinions, to come share and some of the ideas and uh, compare notes. And so I ask, Lord, that you would be here, that you would give us your spirit, that we, you would help us to be good listeners and clear thinkers, and may our words be sweet and winsome, and may they bless each other, and may you be glorified. So hear my prayer, in the name of Jesus, amen. amen. Yeah, so uh, Paul and I, some of you may well know, have spoken on numerous occasions online. He was gracious enough to sort of give me a platform, uh, help my channel More Christ come along nicely. And it's, I've learned so much from Paul. The substance of the conversations, how to have deep conversations, respectful of people, himself and Jonathan have been fantastic personally towards me. So I just want to say that first of all. And um, so let's start off with the nice easy stuff then. So one of the first themes that I wanted to ask Paul about and we can get into it together is the church as a stumbling block to Christ and how that might actually be resolved. So we see this um, hostility that people have towards the church as an institution, but yet here you are as a pastor tapping into something that uh, is happened to form these communities. You are getting this, these dedicated 
people coming to events like this. Uh, so I want to just start with that and why you think that is. Well, maybe I can, especially for some of you who, who haven't watched my channel at all, give you a little bit of introduction into how this uh, strange turn of events has come about. I am not a pastor of a large church. I'm a pastor of a very small church. On a Sunday morning, we might have about as many people at church as we have gathered in this room. And um, my father, I'm a third generation minister. My grandfather pastored churches of the Christian Reformed Church in the United States, in the US and Canada. Um, my father pastored a small African American congregation in Patterson, New Jersey, just outside of New York City. And I've been pastoring a small African American, California is very diverse, so some Anglos, people of Dutch ancestry with the Christian Reformed Church, African American, Asian, Hispanic, and I've been doing that for about 20 years. And part of my frustration in, in trying to connect with people from California was also, was often the case that once I would mention I'm a pastor, uh, they don't want to talk. Um, I don't know if, how you would feel that way. There'd be a little bit of curiosity about who a pastor is and the kinds of things that he does, but um, wouldn't really want to have much of a conversation with him. So then I just continued on our way, the congregation getting older and declining in numbers and, and always was interested in things out in the world. And I, I saw, um, I saw video, some videos by this Canadian psychologist, Jordan Peterson, and that was quite curious, the kind of things he was talking about. He had a biblical series. But what really caught my interest was that there were a lot of often young men who were saying things like, I used to watch Sam Harris videos, I used to consider myself an atheist, and now I listen to Jordan Peterson, and now I'm curious about Christianity and the Bible. And I thought, well, that's interesting. I haven't heard that. And so I thought, well, YouTube, um, I've been making some YouTube videos with a disabled member of my church who um, wanted to do a TV show and asked me to be on it. And I wasn't going to go down to public access, so we'd make little YouTube videos. We call it the Freddie and Paul show. So I thought, well, I'll make a little video. Uh, three things that a pastor, that, um, three things that a Christian pastor thinks about Jordan Peterson. <laughs> and... The next day I had 200 subscribers, and I thought, that is strange, and it just kept growing. And then, the next Sunday, someone comes to my church with a rolled up, um, with a rolled up uh, self-made poster and hands it to me and says, Hi, my name is Rick. I've never been to church before in my life. I saw you on YouTube. Here I am. Okay. And then I start getting emails and phone calls. And all kinds of people that want to have a conversation with me. And I thought, this is a very strange thing, that I've been in this church for 20 years, and a good number of people haven't wanted to give me the time of day. People would knock on the church door, they need $20 for gas, they're out of food, uh, they want help with something, because that's what churches do, but to have a conversation, not so much. And suddenly I found, via YouTube and the internet, that there were literally hundreds and sometimes thousands of people that wanted to talk to me and ask questions about the Bible or Christianity. But mostly, what they really needed, and I knew this as a pastor, what they really needed to do was tell their story and explore their story. And so I started having conversations with people. Um, we have in local coffee shops if they're local or online. And then more and more people wanted to do this. And so they got repetitive, and so I would record them sometimes, and I would ask, would it be okay if I would share this conversation with other people on my channel? And so I would. And then more people saw that and said, oh, I can have a conversation with this guy. So I got even more requests, and it just continued on and on and on. And John Van Dock, the guy sitting back there, um, said, you know, Paul, because he had played around with some of these things before, he said, you know, Paul, you should probably get on meetup.com and have other people come to the church. And so we'd have little festivals and all the kinds of things that churches do to try to make connections to their neighborhood, most of which doesn't work at all. I thought, well, what can it hurt? So meetup.com, put a little thing out there, 13 people show up. Most of them 
atheists, most of them not Christians, and we just came to have a conversation. And so we had a conversation as a group. And as this continued to grow, I began talking to other people in other cities. They wanted to do something like this. So I would go to their place and something similar to this, gather people together, we'd have a conversation. John started one in his church. And very quickly we had a network of these groups in California. And I began to realize when people go to church, they expect a few things. Some people who perhaps are a little down and out, they might need a little food or need a little help. Uh, maybe if they um, have a religious question, but most people in America don't seem to have those kinds of questions, at least not the kinds they want to pursue with a minister. They might talk with their friends, but not a minister. Um, maybe if they go to church, they would expect maybe a Bible study, but mostly to have someone talk at them. But as a pastor, one of the things that you, I learned very quickly is that most of what I do with people is listen. Because people come into my office, church people, and they have a problem. And most of the time there's nothing I can do with their problem because usually their complaint is with their spouse or their child or their parent or someone else and they think I can tell the other person to do something different, which never works. But what I mostly do is listen. And so what I learned was that what would it be if church was not just a place you could go to to get a little bit of food or maybe some money for um, gas for your car or petrol, I don't know what you call it here, um, but what if church was a place where you could actually go and have a conversation and share your doubts, your fears, your ideas, and have a reasonable expectation that other people would listen and that other people would care and that maybe in the process of the conversation you might learn something that might be helpful. Now, my church has been slowly dwindling and declining and that's not unusual for a lot of churches. Um, the wonderful people that founded the church are now in their 60s and 70s and I've gathered a few other people along the way so we have a, a few people my age who are, who are keeping the thing together. But then suddenly I find that there are many, many people in Sacramento who are a little unsure about all the kinds of things that the church usually talks about. They've got some questions, but they'd really like to do some exploration. And they never thought, they never thought that church would be a place where they could do this. And as a Christian minister, I would go months without having a productive, thoughtful, fruitful conversation, an honest conversation, because the other thing you get as a minister is people sit down and it's normal to sort of try and tell people what they'd like, you know, what they, oh, I think a minister would like to hear some of this, so, and then people always tell me the same things. But to have people just tell me honestly what they think, to say, well, I left church because these things happened, or it sounded this way, or the church made me feel this way, and if you actually have a space where people can say, this is what I really think about church. This is what I really think about the Bible. And to have me listen. And I don't have to barge in with my idea right away. But usually by the time they get done talking, they'll say, well, what do you think? And then this thing that I am actually hired to do, which most people are, sudden, are trying to avoid, as a minister, I actually get an opportunity. And it's not that they're sitting here waiting to have something foisted on them, but they're actually curious and open. And so for all that's going on in terms of the reputation of the church, and I'm sure here in Ireland you've got way more to say about that than relatively secular California, the thought that the church actually cares about people and not just people with titles or people with names or people with money because in America we don't have we don't have nobility we just have wealth and that then tends to be you drive into the church in a really nice car and the pastor's like and all the members are like oh I want, hope we can get them because you know they'll help with the budget um, no not just people with money or titles or nobility or PhDs but regular people who have problems in their marriage and problems in their job and problems with their kids and problems with their parents and questions about life that they could actually have a reasonable expectation of 
being able to ask some questions. And they may not get answers that will resolve everything, but to just have a little community that cares. And some of you might say, well, that's why I have friends. But I live in California, and a lot of people didn't grow up there. And a lot of people are busy running around in their jobs and watching their screens. And so a lot of what a lot of people need is just a friend. And I think a big, I think a big challenge for the church has been to help regular people who have perhaps never been to church before in their life understand what a caring community can do for them. And that one of the things that we discovered is that, at least in America, there are very few places that will do that. The university is about one thing and the school is about another thing and all the businesses are about other things. But a church is actually a place that is, has people who have the capacity to care and the capacity to listen and the capacity to share. And so for me, this, and eventually I renamed it Estuary because Jordan Peterson became political and that would turn as many people off as would turn as many people on. But, <coughs> but Estuary was a place where you could come and you could talk and you could listen and you could find. So I think, that, I think that's both part of the problem that has developed in churches, that people have no reasonable expectation of anybody caring about them, they're finding community, and at least how I found the beginning of a way out. Hmm. Thanks for that, Paul. And um, I suppose to go back to Jordan Peterson then, well, originally, I suppose, what do you think it was that resonated with him so significantly, Bill, upon what you said? And I suppose, what are your hopes now for the second wave that we talked about with Peterson, good and ill, with the kind of recent move to Daily Wire and stuff like that? Throwing people off, but also. I, one, of, one of the things I realized fairly early on was that if I was, say, preaching in the book of Genesis, you look at the Genesis story, especially in an older translation of the Bible, and you have kind of a flat earth surrounded by water, and there's a dome, and there are pillars, and, and everybody in church is imagining a world in which we're somehow on this globe, and there's a moon going around, and we're going around a sun, and there's galaxies. And there's a real disconnect between what C.S. Lewis called the discarded image, or this um, ancient which led into the classical, which led into the medieval model of the universe, conceptual model, and the world that people are living in. And what, what I mean is what really caught my attention about Jordan Peterson was that it seemed he was trying to, and he was being successful in giving contemporary people an image of, or a connection between this other world and the world we live in now. And I, I think Jung was a part of that. Um, there's a lot that got involved in that. But again, a, a, big, a big part of the problem with the church was that, oh, the church, the church is too moralistic, the church is too hypocritical, the church is uncaring, and the church doesn't relate to anything that I have to do. And Peterson, in his, in his rather strange way, made the Bible accessible in a certain way and attractive and practical, especially for young men that I think feel a bit disenfranchised and sort of set to the side and, and really gave some, gave some young men agency to get out of their parents' house and uh, get a job and um, you know, be the kind of man that you know, a, a romantic partner or a woman would be interested in. So, and, and I, you know, I immediately saw Peterson doing this, and I thought, there's going to be a lot of people that listen to him, but won't know what to do next. Because you can sit and watch a video and think, oh, I agree with that. Oh, I agree with that. Oh, I agree with that. And I don't know how many of you remember the Truman Show. Um, actually, at the end of the show, there's this scene with two 
two security guards. Everybody's wrapped up in the Truman Show. And then Truman leaves the set, <coughs> end transmission. Okay, what's up next? And that's what people do. And so I wanted to have something where, okay, you've watched Jordan Peterson. What are you going to do next? How about getting away from the screen, getting into a room with real people, and begin to make friendships, begin to have conversations? Excellent. Thanks, Paul. And uh, so, something we discussed yesterday at dinner was this large group of people that are cut off by the church but aren't card carrying atheists, uh, even materialists, more broadly. Like the Gilchrist, in Gilchrist talks about this hunger for the sacred is there, but yet they'll not cross that line. They'll not join these embodied communities. They're not buying themselves. It's going back to the kind of religare that uh, John Verrecki talks about binding. Uh, you know, what do you think about that? And maybe what we can do as Christians to reach out to those people? How do we then draw them into the, these communities? Does that make sense? I. So, in, I, I live and work in a rather distressed area of Sacramento there. You probably see on your news even um, the homeless situation in, in California. A lot of homeless people, um, a lot of substance abuse. This at the same time that there's a big walking away from the church. And when I look at young people walking away from the church, I very much see affluence. Um, if if they don't have a problem, um, they can go to school, and if they can get a job, if they can watch a lot of Netflix, if they can get sort of their amusements, that will kind of keep them distracted for a while. And what will happen is that at some point, I think the nihilism that is deep in our culture will begin to take root. And there'll be a problem that they can't solve. And as a minister, I do a lot of watchful waiting with people. Because for most people, as long as life's going on pretty well, they're, they're happy. You know, there's food on the table. They have a job. They're able to get a car, get a, get a girlfriend, or, or whatever. And it's not, they, they don't come knocking on my door until they have a problem. Um, one of the things that happened with the Jordan Peterson wave was, after I had had dozens and maybe hundreds of conversations, I began noticing a pattern, which was that many of the people coming to me had been depressed. And in fact, um, we, we should mention this, this letter that we received from someone who um, is a mother of a young man who, I don't know the circumstances, but lost his job and she's worried about, worried about depression for him. And Many of, the, many of the people that I was talking to, the more I thought about it and listened to it, basically nihilism in the culture had given them what John Verbeke called the meaning crisis. And, and for, for many of them, listening to Jordan Peterson biblical series could sort of lift them out of it. And that gave them enough energy to begin taking next steps. And... And, and deep in, in, at the center of this meeting crisis is the idea that all this world is, is some fortuit, fortuitously random accumulation of, of things that work well enough, but there's really no meaning to it. And meaning is merely a feeling that you might be able to generate about the circumstances of your life, but there's nothing deeper, it's not about anything. And, and I think many young men, and I think part of the reason this particularly hits men, is that for some reason, men need to have meaning to get up off the couch and go out in the world and do something. I think for, for many women, they're, um, if they wind up with a child, that child will be a very powerful, meaningful generator. That um, they want to keep that child alive and they want that child to thrive. And so that child, but for many men, if they don't have that, 
Something needs to push them. And there's a deep relationship between meaning and the sacred. That there has to be, there has to be something that cannot be deconstructed and will not be deconstructed. Something of, something of real value that then energizes the pursuit of it, the protection of it, the desire for it. In, in Jesus' world, words, the pearl of great price. And so what I've seen is that we do have this, this meaning crisis, and many were sort of falling into this, these nihilistic pits. And at some point, they begin to wake up and say, this is no way to live. I might have a big screen TV, I might have a car, I might have a job, I might have a television, but none of that is worth anything if nothing is sacred beyond satisfying my own desires and amusements. So in terms of what I've seen in this movement, that's, that's really sort of at the bottom of it. Mm. Thanks, Paul. And then, um, before we fit one more question, and even before opening it up for question and answers, so something I was thinking about recently was today, in contrast with most of human history, the distinct challenges that the internet and things like that have brought about, the number of people that we're inter interacting with, without those deep meaningful relationships. Like, if you look at evolutionary history, we were in these small tribes, small groups, we found our meaning, our identity, all these things immersed within that milieu. And what are some of the major challenges, I suppose, adapting to that? particularly through the screens that are, we're mediating our relationship with. And obviously, as people with YouTube channels, we're trying to use that in a way that is a healthy a supplement to what we hope is the staple of these communities. I wonder what you think about that and some of the challenges and opportunities in that <coughs> big picture of the kind of human history, I suppose. Yeah. Does that make sense? So before, before I was in Sacramento, I was a... I was a missionary in the Dominican Republic, and I worked with Haitians. And in the Dominican Republic, Haitians, the Haitians are the, the people that do the dirty work in the country. They pick the coffee, they cut the sugar cane, they do the construction, they're the unskilled laborers, and they make very little money. And what was, what was remarkable is that for all of the time I spent in the Dominican Republic, I never once heard of a suicide of a... Haitian individual. And you might imagine they're living in terrible housing, they're, they're dealing with ethnic discrimination, um, they have very, very little or no uh, legal or political protection, they have tremendously difficult lives, but they don't kill themselves. And then you come to a place, not too many years ago, there was an article about the suicide rate in San Jose, California. San Jose is Silicon Valley. One of the wealthiest parts of North America. And these are children of the titans of industry in the world today. And they have a high suicide rate. Haitians don't. Why? Well, a lot of this has to do with meaning. Now, these screens that we have are just, you know, I, I can't tell you how many times I go through a supermarket and there's a, a hurried mom, and she's pushing the cart. She's got. She's not having a meaning crisis. She, she, she's trying to get the food on the table, trying to manage the family. She's not having a meaning crisis at all. So she's trying to manage this little child, so she sets the child in, in the cart, and what does she put in front of the child? A screen. And, and, in, and even in my generation, when we had television, you know, one box in the house, put the kid in front of a screen. Okay? Keeps the attention, just and our ability to gather and keep attention has in fact gotten greater and greater now that we have the internet and YouTube and social media that is specifically designed often by the same people that design the casinos in places like Las Las Vegas, Nevada to keep our attention. We just we just we just keep the attention, but there's nothing behind the attention, which is, which is very different from a human being. Uh, last, 
last night or two nights ago, we had an estuary meeting. We started an estuary group in Manchester, and one young man came to that. And I know this what this young man. I've had a number of conversations with him over YouTube, and he has his own um, has his own YouTube channel. And my concern was he was going to come in and he's got some philosophical ideas and he would come into a small group and he would dominate the conversation. One of the things we do and the way we set up these conversations is, well, number one, he can't do that because everybody's going to get a chance to talk and everybody's going to pick the topic. But the other thing that stops him is people. You have a relationship with the screen. You put anything on that screen you want. You sit down with another human being, there's resistance. Every single one of you here listening to me, some of you are, uh, I really came here for Kings North. I don't know who this <laughs> Vander Clay guy is. Uh, he's a preacher, so I don't talk too much. But all of you have your own ideas. All of you have your own imaginations. There's a stop in there. And if I actually want to engage with any single one of you, well, there's a fair amount of resistance because I've got these ideas and you've got those ideas and I've got these perspectives and I talk in this funny way and you know <coughs> on and on and on we go when you meet another human being well you actually have someone formidable with whom to contend so a screen is easy and a screen holds your attention but another human being well now you've got something and if in fact the exchange goes well, it might become meaningful. I think Walter Perse, um, Walt, Walker Percy in uh, Lost in the Cosmos, his wonderful little book said, you know, said, there's so many strange things about this world. You walk around all day, but then you make eye contact with some people. And you hold that eye contact. And then suddenly, well, you, you don't even know what's going on. <laughs> you know, what, 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 what could happen? And that's... Every single conversation we have is potentially a bid for a relationship that can take any of us someplace that we have no idea where. So, yeah, and I think that's why a screen is easy. Thank you, Paul. So, I'll just open it up. If anyone has any questions now, please, uh, I'd love to get you all involved more in line with what we're talking about. If you do. Just want to raise their hands, and if we just ask if anybody has any questions, just to keep it <laughs> number one as an actual question, not these long statements that we've had in the past. <laughs> and number two, if a uh, just two or three sentences, something simple. Does anybody want to kick us off? Please, yeah, Al. Let's start. I start from a very short one. Sorry for my ignorance, but who is Jordan Peterson? <laughs> uh. Jordan, great question. Jordan Peterson um, was a professor at University of Toronto, and he had, he was sort of a star professor. Um, students loved him, one of the top professors there. I'd been involved a little bit in politics, and then in 2016 a bill came up, um, C-16, that mandated um, anyone who refused publicly to use whatever pronoun a person desired um, might be subject to um, some censure by a human rights tri tribunal. And he thought that this legislation was overstepping the mark. And um, actually the story goes, his wife was away one evening and he had been playing around. He played around with YouTube quite a bit. And usually when he, something bothered him, he couldn't sleep, he'd get up and he'd write something. But he decided, well, I'm just going to turn on the camera and yell at YouTube. <laughs> and so he was upset about this bill. And he, in fact, he testified to... Um, the parliament about this bill and he kind of made a YouTube screed which went viral and then the other professors at the university tried to um, get him to retract what he had said. He's kind of a stubborn man. He said, no, I won't retract it. So then they asked the university to fire him and all, and all of this drama over this which sort of launched him to be a bit of a, a cult figure um, in the culture war in, in North America over free speech and a number of other issues. And so now he's, um, he's, he's left the university and he's, he's kind of a public intellectual writer and he's been to Europe and a variety of places. But it was, it was the biblical series that caught my attention because again, 
what he was doing both in his classroom and then, then on a bigger stage was a whole bunch of people began to ask deeper questions about meaning. And when I saw that, I thought, that's an avenue for further investigation for a lot of people. So if you just if you go to YouTube and type in Jordan Peterson, you'll learn plenty. <laughs> Yes, yes. Well, while we're assembling the cast of characters here, we've got Jordan Peters on stage now. The other person I would like to introduce on stage, who has often appeared beside Kermit the Frog, is Jonathan Pajot. Where does he fit in your, in your story? So, so Jonathan Pajot, Jonathan is a, is a very interesting guy. He grew up in Quebec. His, his family, his, his parents had been um, French-Canadian Catholics, like much of Quebec, very Catholic area, and were rather disgusted at how things were going and became evangelical Christians. And then Jonathan grew up and um, was an artist and went to art school. Also had an interesting relationship with his brother. As he went to art school, he began asking deeper questions about what has, what has happened in the culture? And Quebec is kind of an interesting um, study in secularization and religion in, in modernity. And so Jonathan began asking deeper questions. And he and his brother, Matthew, Machu, I can never say his name right. I don't speak French. Um, began having a lot of interesting discussions about symbolism. And they began developing a lot of ideas about symbolism. Jonathan then actually went and became a um, Mennonite Central Committee missionary in Congo for a while, working with artisans. But this, um, his interest in symbolism really drove him towards um, becoming an icon carver in the Orthodox Church. And he began seeing similar things in the culture to Jordan Peterson. And so one time, he saw Jordan Peterson on Ontario Public Television. And so he wrote him a letter and said, this was before C-16 and all of that stuff, and said, I think you and I have some interesting similar ideas. And so Jordan and Jonathan became friends. And after Jordan blew up on YouTube, Jordan kind of told Jonathan, well, you should probably try out this YouTube thing. And so Jonathan founded what he calls the symbolic world in which he began talking about symbolism and really trying to connect people back to uh, classical Christian, Orthodox Christian, uh, medieval symbolism. Again, it, what's amazing to me, this is my first time in Europe at all, walking into Europe, walking through the Netherlands, especially where I spent, we spent a lot of our time, I began, because I've been following Jonathan's channel, noticing, oh my goodness, this stuff, is, this stuff is all around you here. Maybe it's so familiar you can't see it. You know, I live in Sacramento, California, and so many people in Sacramento have never been to Yosemite, um, Yosemite National Park, where people from all over the world come. Maybe it's so familiar to you, you don't see it, but this is the world that you're living in. And so I struck up a conversation with Jonathan Peugeot, and he and I have been talking back and forth, and actually it's, he even introduced me to Paul Kingsnorth, and that's sort of where this whole thing has gone. So Peugeot has been a very big influence in many people's lives, basically taking sort of nihilistic, secular people and saying, there's a far bigger, richer world that you're living in the middle of. And it's a little strange to you, but there's some introductions. So that's Peugeot. Thank you. Thanks, John. And is that any other questions? Yeah, I'm just, just interested in... Um, these forums creating that conversation. So we live in an increasingly tri tribalized and polarized world, don't we? Converse, the art of conversation it seems to be lost. Yes. I'd just be interested in a little bit more information, you know, how do you construct those spaces and create those spaces? I'd be fascinated. So, so when, I, when my YouTube stuff happened, um, I had met John on an online forum and John is part of the same denomination I am. And so John immediately contacted me and said, let's, let's work on this. And we first had these Jordan Peterson meetups. And then 
we began to see that Jordan Peterson's name was uh, turning away as many people as it was attracting. So I had this image of an estuary. And then the question was, well, how can we support these groups? We need something. And John had been, John made the pivot too. And he, he basically put together sort of a four, could you talk about that just real briefly, John, kind of the four step? He, he, he came up with the idea and the structure and then I gave it a name. I called it the Estuary Protocol. Uh, he didn't like the name, he wanted to call it the Estuary Experience, but I thought, no, nah, it's more of a protocol, it's how we go through. But the idea is to structure a conversation of people who don't necessarily have a, a standing connection in a way that one person won't dominate the conversation, which is usually the downfall of, let's say, a breakout group. So, John, you want to just briefly go through? You want me to say something about the estuary experience? <laughs> <laughs> With John, nothing is easy. <laughs> so I'd be happy to do that. Uh, actually, what it is, it's a way to get each person's ideas and thoughts and prominent preoccupations on the table. So I start every meeting by asking, what is your, uh, since the last time we were together, what have you been thinking about? But that is too big a question. So then we narrow it down into four areas. What have you been thinking about since the last time we were together intellectually? Have you read a book, listened to a podcast, watched a YouTube video that captured your imagination and you, you were intrigued by it and you've been thinking about it? But we also live in a context, so things happen in your town. There might be an election or a flood or an earthquake or some horrible accident or uh, something in the news that captured your imagination and you've been obsessing about that. But we're also people. And so there's thirdly, personally, um, maybe you have a new baby in your family or you got divorced or you got a new job or you moved to a different house or a different town. These are all things that impact you personally and that could could significantly affect the way you are thinking that particular week. And we may not actually end up talking about that, but it is nice to know that about each other so we can be people and persons to one another. And fourthly, there is the fact that we are together as a group, and so I've coined the word estuarily. Maybe you would like to say something about the way we structure our meeting. Maybe you would like to have better refreshments or uh, put the chairs in a circle instead of in a square, or uh, move to a different venue, or get a different leader, depose the leader, get a new one. And so the, these are the four areas that I invite people to share in order to put things on the table. And once things are on the table, different topics are put on the table. Everybody has a little time that they can just share something. And then once it's on the table, then we go around the room one more time and we say, well, of all the things that are on the table right now, which most appeal to you as a topic for further conversation? And then it's kind of like a democratic sort of thing, you know? I mean, if the majority of the people decide that they want to talk about this thing, and it also encourages people, I, I encourage people, but it encourages people to listen very carefully to what each person is saying, because you're going to be called upon to pick that up and say, that really intrigued me when you said that. Or, you know, what he said and what she said, they're kind of the same thing. They belong together. So maybe we could talk about that. So that's kind of the way the protocol works in order to both get topics on the table so we're not sitting here in total silence and also to prevent any one person from running their soapbox and taking over the show. That's all I know and that's all I have to say. So then I asked John, said, well, John, I don't have time to train all these people, so... He practices that online with people, and we've got about 20 groups going now. And I think probably after this tour, we'll probably have 25, or we, we're poking at Mark to start one here. But um, we'll see. So that's what we're that's what we've been doing. Mark and Daniel, actually. Mark and Daniel. And uh, any further questions? Yes, please. Uh, a double barrel question, and maybe a bit random. So, first of all, our I don't know if you can answer this, but are men and women having uh, the same type of meaning crisis or different meaning crisis? And then more, the, the second part of the question more relation to men. So in terms of things that will happen in the culture, one of the things that's quite striking from my point of view 
was seeing Star Wars for the first time and that hero myth of Finn yeah. Skywalker and the VHR coming along and being able to watch that hundreds of times yeah. and this feeling that that is something to aim for a goal to be that hero to, to see the universe so to speak and that, yeah. that's been repeated yeah. so that's implanted in a lot of young boys minds yeah. as to how meaning that's what you need to do you need to see the universe yeah. um, and you can see that in the MCU as well so that's kind of connected to the first question okay? so yeah, just your thoughts on that I think more and more women are having a meaning crisis as society is making them and inciting them to live like men. As I said before, I think, you know, I have five children. Um, children change the people around them. And as in many of the spaces we live, we are living in childless spaces. I think both sexes are having a meaning crisis. I remember we did one meetup in San Francisco right before a Jordan Peterson event. And so I was able to gather a lot of people that I had never seen before. And there were a number of women in that meeting who were in their 40s and 50s who had never married, never had children. And a number of those women were angry. And they said, my career was supposed to fulfill me. And it hasn't. And, you know, I, some of my children are mimicking some of the lies that are told them by this world. Mm, children. And I look at my children and say, having my children is one of the most meaningful, rewarding thing that I have ever done. I mean, I, I, at this point now, if I think back, if I didn't have my children, how how much less my life, my life would be. I'd have more money. <laughs> I would have had more time for my amusements. But, and I think for that reason, and, and I don't want to say this to put a burden on anyone who for whatever reason has never married or have ne never been able to have children. Um, I think the church, and particularly the older traditions like the Roman Catholic and the Orthodox, have done much better in terms of making space for single people. So I don't want to lay any burdens on any single people. but. And, and, and there's actually a, quite a strong conversation about the place of the, the hero's journey, especially as, um, as Campbell framed it that got iterated in Star Wars. Is that the only way? Is that the best way? That's a rather live conversation. Um, I think, it's a, I think it's, a, it's a powerful archetype, but it's by no means the only one, and especially given in a Christian frame, the kind of hero that Christ is, you know, most heroes that we see in sort of the swords and fantasy spaces um, have victory um, via the blood of their enemies. And Christ, of course, earns victory by shedding his own blood. And so there's an inversion of that, of that story in there. So I, I hope that uh, answers your question. Excellent. Thank you. Yes? Okay. Um, just, I actually just recently read an interesting essay by Charles Eisenstein about the hero very good. Uh, although I just wanted to ask what your opinion would be on, on also on the back of the question about women having meaning crisis uh, and your story about the woman in the supermarket trying to kill the food and the trolley and, and the child. Uh, that what, what do you think is the place of struggle for meaning like the people in Haiti who are, they're so, um, their time is taken up by surviving and we have created so much plenty of what we think is plenty, plenty material and the lack of struggle we have now and, and how that affects our meaning. Uh, I think it's deeply connected. I, I think there's, a, there's, a, there's an element of meaning that simply comes forth by, by trying to survive or trying to protect your children. That's it's simply natural. I think for much of human history, you know, life has been replete with it, but we have this we have this affluence and abundance, and I think you said it well. Of there's all this stuff around us, and, and but at some point we realize that more stuff is just more stuff, and it doesn't satisfy. And so that then you know, as a pastor, that then is often an entree into okay, well, what does satisfy? What is meaning? And so I'm in conversation with 
one of Jordan Peterson's former colleagues, John Vervecchi, who continues to teach at University of Toronto. He's the one who coined the meaning crisis. And Jonathan Peugeot and I will be in conversation with him in uh, Thunder Bay after this trip to Europe. Um, but you know, So he's a non-theist, and that's a long conversation with him. But, but it's also the fact that religion has for, um, for generations been in the midst of struggle, people found strength and therefore also meaning in religion because especially in Christianity, suffering is not fruitless because our master, it was his sufferings that were fruitful for us. And we can see that. The, the sufferings of every good mother are fruitful for their children. Children, that's why she suffers. So, um, yes, meaning and struggle are, are right there at the same place. So is that what the, sorry. <laughs> so is that what the Haitians have that we don't have? It would be better to ask what is it the Haitians have that we don't have? They certainly have struggle. I think all of us have struggles too. I, I, That's not sufficient um, to make you happy. But their struggles, their struggles are very tangible. I mean, they're dealing with very serious poverty. Most of the Haitians, while I worked with, I was working with pastors and churches. Um, they also had a real sense of, they had a real sense of triumph in their faith. And, you know, making churches grow in very poor parts of the world is very easy. So they have faith that we don't have. What is it they have that we don't have? It's not, to me, it's not, I don't understand when you say they're happy because they have struggled. I didn't That's say they're sad. happy. <laughs> I said they didn't. They they weren't suicidal. I. I. In my I I, I have psychology background and, and in that, um, the understanding is that once you have enough to eat and once you have shelter, then. Actually, uh, depression. Unhappiness, material comfort, material comfort beyond that does not make you happier. So I'm wondering what it is the Haitians have that we don't have. They, you say they have faith. Some of them have faith. Uh, the other, you know, the other irony is that I work with a lot of homeless people, street people. I don't know any atheists on the street. It's simply not there. And I think the, the other assumption that we have beneath our culture is, I remember visiting an alligator farm in Florida, just an enormous alligator just sitting in this warm pool of water and thinking to myself, well, that alligator must get bored. And I talked to the guy who cared for him, says, no, I just throw a chicken at him and he's absolutely fine. And I think we almost imagine that people are like that alligator that, oh, we throw food at him. You know, okay, they got a little more brain, so throw a YouTube at them. They'll be fine. And I think Dostoevsky made this perfectly clear in Notes on the Underground. People are not like that. Mm -hmm. And and when it comes to, you know, obviously, suicide itself is a very complex dynamic, and I don't want to reduce it to anything here. But um, man does not live on bread alone. <laughs> That's what I've seen. I've heard the children's situation described of the child with the tablet of the same described as privileged neglect. <laughs> That's a great word. Attention is costly, which YouTube knows because they're, they're working to get it. Um, and the child needs it. Thank you, folks. I'm going there. Nobody can stop me. Ooh, I'm going there.